So we're joined by Gitanas Nalseda, the president of Lithuania. Now, your country is, of course, a member of the European Union and of NATO, a very strong supporter of Ukraine. If we start with this topic, the Chinese president, uh, Xi, spoke with the Ukrainian president, Zelensky, for the very first time since Russia's large-scale invasion last year. He spoke to him this week. What is your take? Can China break a peace? I think China has a chance to become uh, the player, uh, which is important in international field. And of course, it could be also the moderator in this conflict, in the war of Russia against Ukraine, but with one precondition. So far, we didn't see and we didn't hear anything about the condemnation of this war. Uh, the China did not condemn uh, the war of Russia against Ukraine. And this is very important to understand whether China is on the side of Russia or China is on the side of international rules-based order. And uh, as long as uh, China hesitates to take very clear position on that, it, it's very difficult to believe that it might be the credible moderator in this conflict. And of course, we uh, hear the rumors about uh, support of China in order to circumvent the sanctions imposed by European Union and other like-minded countries. So this is also not a very good sign. And of course, it cannot serve as a certain confidence to trust in China. And would President Xi boost his credibility as a potential broker if he went to Kyiv? Is that one of the preconditions? I think it would be important visit. But again, if we talk uh, about uh, negotiations or peace negotiations, it's very important to understand that the uh, most important voice is Ukrainian's voice. And Ukraine has to decide what conditions uh, Ukraine is ready to take. And I think one of the most important elements of this peace uh, negotiation is respect to the territorial integrity of Ukraine. So uh, now we are talking about the country which is occupied, 20% of the territory of Ukraine is occupied by Russia. So what we, uh, about this uh, territory? What are the uh, preconditions of peace negotiations? And uh, this is uh, very important to not to bargain on behalf of Ukraine and to, to make uh, some territorial concessions uh, at the cost of Ukraine. I think it's not a fair way of peace negotiations, but we all are interested to see these peace negotiations and of course the final result of those negotiations. But again, territorial integrity is a sacred element of these uh, negotiations. And in the meantime, Lithuania, your country, of course, shares a border with Belarus and also with Kaliningrad Oblast, so a Russian exclave. Um, how confident are you that Russia will not invade mm. the Baltic states? You know, quite long time we have these unpredictable neighbors and we used to adjust ourselves to this geopolitical reality. Uh, and now, yes, you are uh, correct by saying that Lithuania feels like the sandwich between a highly uh, militarized Kaliningrad region and Belarus. Yes, we have quite a long border with Belarus, about 600 kilometers. Uh, we try to do our best, and of course, first of all, we use the instruments of collective, uh, collective security. And as you know, Lithuania is a member of NATO since 2004. But we do a lot in order to modernize our armed forces, to uh, welcome uh, forward uh, defense elements in Lithuania, and uh, Madrid summit was very important in that regard. And we have very close cooperation with Germany. Now we are take, uh, talking about uh, scaling up of forward uh, defense elements up to brigade size level, and probably one of the possible subjects of my discussion today with Chancellor Scholz will be, will be uh, this, this uh, deployment of brigade in Lithuania. So we try uh, to spend more on defense, 
uh, 2.5% this year and the possibility to borrow up to 3% of GDP. And we are highly interested that those elements should be discussed also in Vilnius NATO summit, uh, which will take place in July. Forward defense, implementation of Madrid summit uh, declarations, 2% uh, of GDP as a baseline, not as a ceiling of uh, military expenditures, and of course uh, uh, practical support to Ukraine, and uh, perspectives uh, to bring Ukraine closer to NATO in the future. What is your message to Olaf Scholz going to be? Are you uh, going to repeat your call for a permanent presence in your country as well? Germany is your partner station in terms of enhanced forward presence, but uh, of course that's a rotational basis. Uh, Germany showed very strong and good political will uh, as we signed this communique uh, last year, even several weeks ahead of uh, NATO summit in Madrid. And yes, deployment of brigade in uh, Lithuania is a possibility. We try to use it, uh, use it by 100%. For that, we do our homework and we invest now in uh, creation of new training areas in Lithuania. We try to invest and we will do it uh, very intensively in the next uh, two, three years in uh, accommodation infrastructure. So we have to be ready to uh, welcome full-size brigade until 2026. And we even speeding up some processes which usually take quite long time and we are quite successful in that. For example, Rudinik training area was supposed to be opened in 2028. Now we uh, see that it will happen in 2026. So we try to do our best, and, but of course it depends also on the readiness of German side. But those issues could be uh, discussed, and I think uh, there is a possibility to discuss uh, these options and to implement the plan as it was, as it was envisaged. Do you think there's enough awareness in uh, the field of your international partners about the other threats that are coming from Russia when you talk about hybrid threats? Yes. You've put forward a suggestion to put uh, the patriarch of the Russian Orthodox Church on the EU sanctions list. Why do you, how do you justify that and how realistic is that that that's going to happen? We see the marriage of the church with uh, political uh, bodies in Russia. And uh, as long as uh, Patriarch Kirill did not condemn uh, the war, and uh, I would say oppositely, he's supporting the war of Russia in Ukraine. You know, for me it's absolutely natural conclusion that uh, he should be included in, into the list of sanctioned persons, like other persons which play important role in the Russian society. And what are you hearing from your counterparts? Is that going to happen? Is it realistic? You know, sometimes uh, some issues or uh, discussion about some, some issues takes longer time. But Lithuania is always on the side of stronger sanctions. Because we saw in the past that our sanctions, yes, they have impact. But discussions take too long time. And sometimes the measures are weaker than we could anticipate or we could expect. And then we are complaining that those sanctions so far did not bring the result as expected. But this is because the sanctions probably were too weak. Now we are already discussing 11th package of sanctions. But so far, Russian economy still is doing not very well, but we could expect and we uh, our uh, vision is expect larger drop of economic activity in Russia and uh, because otherwise it's very difficult to change the attitude and behavior of this country. How worried are you about Ukraine fatigue happening in the countries uh, that are supporting Ukraine? Mm. President Biden, for example, he has announced that he will run again as president, but what would change if the Republicans took the White House again? So far, I do not any signs. Uh, I don't see any signs of fatigue, and uh, especially in my country, because I see how practically 90-90% uh, of the people from the bottom of the heart are supporting Ukraine with all means. 
humanitarily, we try to support militarily, politically, economically. And I see that our partners, uh, our countries are doing the best and doing a lot in order to support Ukraine. Because everyone understands this war is not about free, not only about the freedom of Ukraine. This is a war about the freedom of all of us. Mr. President, thank you very much.